first off, I really appreciate you having me here this morning. Uh, it's always fun to uh, to to uh, work with the Heritage Center. It's a it's a fantastic place, and around hill climb time, what better place to uh, uh, to host information about uh, about the hill climb than Manitou Springs, which is right at the uh, base of Pikes Peak. So as you can see, I'm joining you this morning from our uh, our little race shop here in uh, in our garage up in uh, up in uh, beautiful Monument, Colorado, and uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the uh, the hill climb, give you a little more background since that's coming up in just a couple of weeks now of what it's all about. And there are just so many great stories that have come out of this race over the years that uh, I'll just give you kind of a little sampling of uh, some of the entertaining stuff that's uh, that's come out of this legendary world famous race. And so uh, just a little bit, this is not mostly about me, but I'll start with a little bit of background of why am I even talking about this? Um, so I've been racing uh, for quite a while, almost 20 years. Uh, and I was for ages and ages, I was a, a road racer. Uh, so I would race on race tracks, uh, not oval tracks, but I would do uh, tracks where we turn left and right. Um, so in hindsight, that prepared me, I guess, pretty well for the hill climb where you make 156 turns left and right. Um, yeah, I'd always been aware of the hill climb for many, many years, but never thought that was anything that I would do until they paved it. And when it became paved, I actually had a fellow racer come up to me and say, hey, you should, you should do this. You can, you can do this now. It's just like a bigger racetrack. And I said, yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Maybe we'll do it as a bucket list thing once. Um, and uh, yeah. Now, uh, you know, eight years later, I've done it uh, many, many times and uh, it's kind of gotten in my blood. So, um, you know, what, what makes this race really unique uh, is that it takes uh, amateur races, racers like myself and have the opportunity to race with um, full professional drivers. All they do for a living is, is drive, uh, drive race cars, which uh, what a job that is. Uh, and so we get to meet a bunch of uh, a bunch of famous racers, which is really cool, and actually compete against them, which is uh, which is a blast. So uh, that's one of many things that makes this race really unique is its its mix of amateur and pro racers. And so, okay, so I yeah you know, raced the I've raced the 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 race for for several years. Um, I decided after a while, it might be a, a good thing to kind of give back to the racing community to write a little guidebook. And that's where the idea for this book started. It's not at all where it ended up, but where it started was to write a little guidebook for rookies who would come to Pikes Peak. And, you know, it's, I discovered myself, it's almost impossible to prepare yourself for this race. And I thought I was coming in and I was gonna be the most prepared person in the history of this race. Um, and, and I found out the hard way uh, that it was impossible really to prepare fully for this. The picture that you're seeing on the screen right now is an illustration of that. This is actually of my very first practice run, the very first time I ever took a race car up Pikes Peak. Uh, all that smoke that you see there, um, it's not the tires, or it's not the engine blowing up or anything like that. It's the tires smoking because they're all locked up because I'm seeing uh, with my probably my eyeballs this big, um, a corner coming up that was about a 20 mile an hour corner and I was going over 100 miles an hour into it. Uh, so suffice it to say, um, I thought I was well prepared and I wasn't. And so I thought I'd write a book that would uh, hopefully, uh, actually I didn't crash here, by the way, came really close to crashing, but I didn't. Um, but I thought this would be a great way to uh, kind of prepare people a little bit better than, than I had prepared for the race. Um, it morphed into something totally different though. When I started uh, writing the book uh, and started to talk to people who have uh, raced uh, Pikes Peak over the years, uh, number one discovered it's a great collection of characters. Uh, and, uh, and they have just amazing stories. The history of this race has been around for so long. Uh, they had a, you know, a lot of great stories to share. And so the book totally changed into something uh, with sharing a, a lot of stories, telling about what it's like to go up all 156 turns up Pikes Peak uh, at high speed, which is very different than going up in your uh, your your uh, your family station wagon at uh, 10 or 20 miles an hour. 
Um, so, you know, gives fans a, a chance to see what that, uh, what that would be like, and also share some of the just beautiful photography that's existed up there. It's just such a gorgeous place. And I was able to work with a lot of wonderful photographers uh, who are able to capture the beauty of this, um, you know, yeah, as, as we saw earlier, a coffee table style book. So just a little background. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how long this has all been around. So before the Pikes Peak Highway existed in its current form, there was a carriage road and literally was like two ruts, as you see in this picture here, like two ruts going up the side of the mountain. And if you've driven up Pikes Peak, you know that that's probably pretty, uh, pretty hairy, but it was intended for literally horses and carriage and that sort of thing to go, uh, to go up to the summit. Very long voyage, very hairy. But in 1901, and think about the state of the automobile in 1901, um, a couple gentlemen from Denver decided they were going to take a, a motorized automobile and try to drive it up to the summit of Pikes Peak. And here's an actual picture of them and that automobile making that attempt in 1901. It was all of three and a half horsepower. And you can see what that carriage road was like up top. It's, it's almost generous to call it a road at all. It's almost more of a trail. Um, but uh, you, you, you'd probably never guess what this car was powered by. Again, this was 1901. It was actually powered by steam. People are familiar with like the Stanley steamer. This wasn't a Stanley steamer, but this car was powered by steam. It took them 24 hours to get to the summit, but hey, they made it. And look at what the condition of the road was like and look at what the car was like. So a monumental achievement to get up to the summit of Pikes Peak uh, at all in 1901. So they blazed the trail for uh, getting cars up to the summit of Pikes Peak. Of course, that was not a, a, a method of getting up that was for the masses. So fast forward a little bit and um, Spencer Penrose, who uh, a lot of us with local uh, historical knowledge are probably familiar with, uh, who built the Broadmoor among other things, decided let's build a highway up to the top of Pikes Peak and we could make it a toll road and we could make some money and we can draw people to Colorado Springs. Hopefully they'll stay at my hotel, the Broadmoor, but it'll be great for Colorado Springs uh, in general. And so, um, and he had the resources to do that. So um, he, uh, and talk about resources, you can see these are custom made uh, highway construction trucks just for Pikes Peak. And you see there's not even any tires on them. They're you know, interesting looking wheels with chains and you know, big kind of things here. These were specially made to, to build the, uh, the world's highest highway as it was um, uh, tagged back in the day. Um, and uh, you know, they started building this in the teens. Uh, again, this is over a hundred years ago when they, uh, when they built this. And once they got it done, so another thing a lot of people don't realize, uh, Spencer Penrose said in 1916, so they completed the highway in 1915. In 1916, he said, well, what better way to promote the fact that we've got this fantastic highway to the summit of America's mountain, uh, or as you can see on this uh, poster here, America's most famous mountain. Uh, what better way to promote it than to have a, a race and invite uh, all of the greatest uh, race car drivers from around the world to compete on it. So this was you know, people think, oh, the highway must have been built and then at somewhere along the line, they decided to do a race off of it. Uh, that's not true at all. They decided to do the race almost immediately after opening the highway. Um, and it was brilliant. It, uh, the Pikes Peak and the Pikes Peak Highway became instantly world famous. Uh, and uh, the, the race has, uh, has survived to this day. So you can see this is actually a copy of the cover of the race program from 1916, um, so pretty cool, 105 years ago, the very first race. Um, obviously things have changed a little bit. You can see what it looked like back around 1916. Um, you know, obviously it was all dirt for most of its history. And um, you, know, you can see what the, what the cars looked like. It was just uh, you know, even wilder than it is today. Um, as I said, Mr. Pen Mr. Penrose decided to invite all of the most famous race car drivers he could to help uh, to run in this race and promote it. And over the years that's continued all the way up to present day that this race has continued to attract world famous, world-class talent 
to the hill climb. And you can see just a few of the examples here of people who have, uh, have raced up Pikes Peak. It's a who's who of motorsports. Um, really, almost anybody who's anybody has done Pikes Peak at some time or other, and most of them have won it. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the road like? Hopefully, most of you have driven it before, but uh, even if you haven't, um, it's just short of 12 and a half miles or 20 kilometers long, 156 turns. So you can imagine over, you know, 12.42 miles, 156 turns, that means you're turning all the time. Uh, and you can see in the background here a picture of just what parts of it look like and illustrate the fact that you are turning all the time. So you're going all the way up to the summit, which is 14,115 feet um, for an elevation gain from the start line of 4,725 feet. So you're going up a long way, uh, which is challenging for both human beings and for machines. Um, it's a 7% average grade, which that's steep. Uh, on average, it does get steeper in places. And I put something here with a little bit of a question mark on it, guardrails. Uh, there actually are some guardrails up Pikes Peak now for the, the safety of the, the public who are driving up and down it uh, 364 days of the year. Obviously, one day of the year is reserved for the race. Uh, and, you know, that's that kind of leads to a funny story I've got of um, after racing up here for for many years, when we race up to the top of the mountain, we end up having a bunch of time on the summit to ourselves because you can't come back down until all the race cars have made it to the top. And that usually takes all day. And so I was sitting up in the uh, in the old summit house uh, a few years ago and talking to a fellow racer. And I said, hey, what do you do for a living? I knew he wasn't a full pro driver. He was like me. He's got a, a day job. And he said, oh, I, I put guardrails in on highways. I said, oh, that's fantastic. And he said, in fact, I did the guardrails up here. Um, at which point I said, okay, I got to ask you a question. When I've had close calls going racing up Pikes Peak, the guardrails are never in the right place to catch me. When I'm going up and I hit the brakes and I'm maybe braking a little bit too late, don't have the grip that I think, uh, I'm sailing off past the edge of the, uh, the guardrail. So it's like, you know, what's the deal with that? They, they don't protect us. And he said, well, they're not designed to protect those of us who are racing up there one day of the year. They're actually meant to protect the, the general public who are using this road and going downhill primarily 364 days of the year. So you, you can actually kind of see on the picture here on this slide, see how the guardrail is on the downhill side of the, uh, of the turn. That's generally true on Pikes Peak that it's on the downhill side. It's meant to catch people who aren't paying attention or maybe have a brake failure or something like that from going off the edge. It's not meant to catch race cars going up. And I can assure you uh, it's the guardrails are mostly useless uh, for us in the race, but the, but they are there and it does give you maybe a little bit of a false sense of security. So again, almost 12 and a half miles and 156 turns, that's really a challenge to memorize a course like that. So what we like to do as racers is break it into three sections. So there's a lower section, which is shown on the screen right now, uh, which has uh, you know, the first 60-ish turns uh, and uh, that's down at the, the bottom, obviously, through the trees. You're down below tree line up to the end of this. Um, so that's the, really the first third of the mountain. The second third of the mountain is where really a lot of the elevation change takes place. It's from Glen Cove, which is a spot where there's a, a little gift shop, restrooms, that sort of thing, up to Devil's Playground or the 16 mile point on Pikes Peak. And you'll see there aren't a lot of turns here. There's only 30 turns, but it's massive eleva elevation gain in a really short uh, period of time. And then the very top of the mountain, you're all above tree line when you get up here, is from Devil's Playground, which is one of the premier uh, fan areas on Pikes Peak, all the way to the finish line. Um, and so you'll see that the, the turns up on the top here are very gradual. They're not as sharp as they are down at the bottom or in the middle part. So that means this is much faster. Uh, and this is also the part of the mountain where you've got the big multi thousand foot drop offs. Um, so if you miss one of these turns, it's really not good. So that's again, part of the charm of it. It's the highest speed and most dangerous part of the course is, uh, is up top. So, um, one of the people who is very generous in helping me with the uh, with the book, who 
uh, knows this race and knew this race better than uh, pretty much anybody uh, was Bobby Unser, um, who we just recently lost uh, just a couple months ago, unfortunately, but uh, he was absolute legend of the mountain. Uh, he had a 30 year span be between his first win and his last win on Pikes Peak. He actually had 13 overall and class wins. Most of those were overalls. Um, few of them were class wins. Um, so again, just a, an incredible legend on Pikes Peak. Um, and uh, and one of the things I had uh, I had asked him. So he's he's all he also of course is probably even better known worldwide uh, for his indie. 500 career, an IndyCar career, and he won that three times, uh, which is in very exclusive company. And he always says, oh, I would never have won uh, Indy uh, without uh, having run Pikes Peak. In fact, it was not even on my radar. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. And he said, yeah, you know, he was, his whole goal with racing was to, uh, to, to win the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb more times than his Uncle Louie did. Um, and, uh, and his, his, his uncle was, you know, a legend of the mountain and he ended up accomplishing that. But, uh, by way of doing that, he actually met a, uh, a, an indie racer named Parnelli Jones, world famous. And, uh, and so I met him and, uh, Parnelli got him a ride at Indy and the rest is history. So, um, pretty impressive, uh, what happened there. Um. Louis Jr. So I was referring to Louis Sr., who's the uncle. Louis Jr. was a brother of Bobby's, um, was a perennial competitor and really terrific uh, driver in the stock car class. Uh, and this is my favorite photo of Pikes Peak ever. Look at his right rear tire and how close that is to dropping down many hundreds, if not a thousand feet. Um, and apparently he drove this way all the time. And that was part of the, uh, the reason for his success. And one of Bobby's great quotes was, you know, he says here, one time I was riding down the mountain with his brother, Louie. He said, I reached over, shut the car off and got out. And I told him, I'm not going to ride with you. You're crazy. And this is Bobby Unser, who's, you know, a legend on Pike Peak. So it just shows the level of craziness uh, that his brother Louie had, uh, but it served him well. Uh, he was, drove right on the edge and uh, as a result was able to go faster than, uh, than anybody else in a lot of cases and have a lot of success on Pikes Peak himself. Um, going back to Louis Sr., uh, to Bobby's uh, uncle, uh, who was you know, kind of the king of the mountain for many, many years up until Bobby started racing really in the 60s. Um, this is uh, my favorite photo of Louis Sr. Uh, so this is the old, old summit house. This is several summit houses ago up on the top of Pikes Peak and he's crossing the finish line and if you notice here, something's wrong. He's actually crossing the finish line backwards, which is pretty amazing. And the story Bobby tells about this one is he said on the very last turn on top of the summit, which there was a, an extra turn up there at the time, uh, his, uh, his uncle Louie spun uh, and then you know, was pointed backwards, had to find reverse, which was not the easiest thing to do in these old cars, get it in reverse, and cross the finish line. Um, so he did that. He said it probably took him 20 seconds or so, you know, probably cost him 20 seconds or so doing this. Um, and then, you know, he was very disappointed and all that. And, but he, he kind of ended the story with that. When I did my research, however, and looked up uh, this year, how did Uncle Louie finish? He finished second by, I believe it was 11 seconds. So he would have won the race if he hadn't spun it. So I can imagine he was fuming after, uh, after this spin out on the very last corner, but it shows the race isn't over until it's over. Uh, and so that's why this is one of my, uh, my personal favorites. I think it's a really cool picture of him going backwards there across the finish line. Speaking of legendary drivers on Pikes Peak, um, Mario Andretti was kind enough to work with me a little bit on the book as well. I was able to contact him and he has incredibly fond memories of Pikes Peak, which he actually won in 1969. Um, and uh, you know, this is what, kind of one of his great quotes is, he said, Af after he won, he swore he'd, he'd never come back here. That He said it, he, he really had to just take way too many risks in order to win it. Uh, everything just had to kind of fall into place and it was just, just way too dangerous. And I think 
that is incredibly true. And that's really what I've kind of personally found to be true is in order to have success up there, in a lot of cases, uh, unless you have a car that's way better than everybody else, you need to be willing to take risks that other people are not willing to take. Uh, and that's how you get up there faster with a slower car in a lot of cases. And um, so this really uh, resonated with me. And I thought that was a, a great quote from Mario, as he said, you know, he did it once. He, you know, actually, he raced it three times, but he, he did it once when he won and he learned how many risks you need to take uh, to win. And he just said that was it. Now, contrast that with his buddy, Bobby Unser, who won this 13 times and competed over three decades. So, um, yeah, kind of a, a different perspective. But again, Bobby was, you know, grew up with his primary goal being Pikes Peak. And Mario came um, really at the behest of, of Bobby Unser, who, uh, who brought him out here to do this. But uh, he has great memories of it. Fast forward to some uh, current day legends. Uh, the, uh, the current all time record holder on Pikes Peak is Romain Dumas of France, uh, who is a full pro driver. Uh, factory driver for Porsche, for many other teams. And uh, in his quote, um, again, he, he puts Pikes Peak right up where they're with everything else. He says, you know, after Le Mans or Pikes Peak, you've got, you know, maybe the, uh, the Monaco Grand Prix, you've got Indianapolis, you know, maybe the Perry Dakar or Monte Carlo Rally. But he said, that's about it in terms of like top five, top six uh, motorsport events in the world. So that kind of frames it even modern day, how important this race is uh, in the uh, the race community, uh, so pretty amazing. One of the uh, local and uh, is Paul Dallenbach, uh, one of the local legends here, who's out of um, the Aspen area in Colorado. Here, uh, great Colorado guy, great racer, um, pro driver, and I, I love this quote from him that you know he says, "I love this race because it's a race where where somebody can dream, yeah, have a dream on a napkin." on a grassroots level and compete with a factory team. And that's what Paul has done over the years. Um, he's, he's always um, designed and built amazing cars and competed head to head with the big factory teams that have multi-million dollar budgets. And it's one of the few places you could do that. You used to be able to do that uh, at races like the Indy 500, uh, but those days are, are kind of long gone. Um, you know, it's become much more uh, corporate and, uh, and more exclusive, but Pikes Peak is still that way. So um, I think that's a, a, a great ringing, ringing endorsement of what's really unique about this, uh, this race still. Also among um, current day uh, famous drivers who have uh, competed on Pikes Peak many times now is Aaron Kaufman, who's a lot of you may recognize from television. Uh, and uh, he, he's just an amazing guy, a great uh, um, great proponent of the race. And uh, this is personally one of my favorite quotes from, from him is that, uh, you know, he says in, in racing, there are real consequences uh, to your decisions and uh, race cars don't give you a pass. And, you know, he feels that's a, a great lesson. And he had said, you know, if more kids got involved in racing, he thinks you know, the other, the youth would be better served because there's so many great uh, lessons that, the, that they can learn uh, from racing in terms of responsibility and focus and commitment and teamwork. So um, Aaron's just an amazing guy, very, uh, very deep thinker, very smart guy. And I, I, I love some of the quotes that he comes up with about this race. So that's some of the, some of the people, uh, and in writing this book, I, I interviewed lots of uh, le legends, some people you know, some people you might not know. Um, so you can read lots of other interesting stories in the book um, from them. Going on to the now the vehicles that you see racing up Pikes Peak. This is just a kind of it looks like a random selection, but it's not. I didn't select these randomly, but you know, a, a montage of different types of vehicles that race up Pikes Peak. So you can see everything from a semi truck here to an to open wheel cars to things that look like prototypes to in the middle that orange one looks kind of like a stock car. Um, and the lower left is kind of like a rally car. So it's a, like a little bit of everything that you see up on Pikes Peak. But the reason I group these photos together is there's one thing in common among most cars that you see going up Pikes Peak. And that is, uh, if you look at all these pictures, the one thing that's in common with all of them is they have huge wings on them. And so why is that? Is it because it looks cool? Well, I think they look cool, but that's really not really why they put uh, those big wings on the cars. 
The reason that they do is that you're up at very high altitude with very low air density um, at very high speeds. And so you need a lot of wing on the back of a car to glue it down to the road so that you can, again, not fly off the road, number one, and uh, number two, maximize your speed through those really high speed corners. Remember when we looked at the, the, the track map, the really high speed corners are all up top where you're in the, the very thin air. Um, so you need a lot of wing to make sure the, the car is able to, uh, to maximize its speed through all of the, the corners. So notice that next time you see photos of um, Pikes Peak cars, look at the wings, uh, both on the front and on the back of the cars. You'll see there are these huge wings on on most of the cars and certainly on almost all the successful ones, um, aerodynamics is absolutely key. All right, great story here. Um, what do you do if you're late for practice? So one of the challenges of Pikes Peak, um, you know, the, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, there are practice sessions that allow you to run up uh, a third of the mountain each day on Tuesday through Friday of race week. Uh, so not this coming week, but the following week, you'll have race cars going up there starting at dawn um, and going until about 8, 8.30 when the, the road opens to the public. Um, you'll have them the, the race cars practicing up there. Uh, in order to do that, though, they need to go through the toll gate, typically around 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning, very early. Um, and it's easy to be late for that. And one of the competitors uh, learned that the hard way that, um, and, and this is a, a competitor who's a, a, a legendary driver who's driven um, everything from open wheel cars to big rigs. And it, um, his name is Bruce Canepa out of California. Um, and he's had got a great history on Pikes Peak. One year he was actually late for practice. And if you're late, if you don't get through as a competitor or a, a crew member by about three o'clock, sometimes 3.30, but it depends on the day. But let's say yeah, it's again, very early in the morning. Uh, if you don't get through the toll gate, they lock it up and they're done. You know, they, they don't want the general public getting up there. So they lock it up and leave it alone. So he slept, uh, he slept late one morning, got to the toll gate, it was locked. He knew his team was already up there, but he had no way to get up there. So he walked around the gate and he happened to see some, uh, uh, I think they're a forest service or something like that, uh, vans or maybe just um, Ranger vans. But anyway, he saw some vehicles there. He walked up and he found one of them had the key in it. So he said, ah, beautiful. You know, it's, it's three something in the morning. I'll just drive it up. It'll take me, you know, 15 minutes or so to get up to the practice or to the, uh, the pits. I'll have a crew member drive it back down. Nobody will be any the wiser. It'll all be great. So he got it, started up, no problem. Drove it up to the pits, got one of his crew guys, said, hey, take this back down there. Somebody follow him down. Um, and, you know, nobody will know what happened. The crew guy took it back down to the uh, uh, toll gate. Unfortunately, there was a ranger there. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but there was a ranger there when he took it back down and uh, poor Bruce got busted for, um, for stealing a car. And uh, as he tells it, what made it even worse is the car had federal plates. So it was a, technically a federal offense. Uh, he almost got kicked out of the race that year, uh, but uh, he managed to, uh, to plead his case and, and still run and uh, and, and of course do well like he always did on Pikes Peak. Speaking of, of Bruce, and he's a, another great storyteller, kind of a, uh, like Bobby Unser in that way. Um, this is the picture of a the nose of uh, his open wheel car that he competed with on Pikes Peak. Uh, and you'll notice, uh, and those of us who are in Colorado are used to seeing this on the front of our cars, that there's all kinds of dings from stones on the, uh, on the front of the car. And I looked at that and I said, I said to Bruce, I said, what's the deal with this? All the cars that you've got in your collection are pristine, but this one is all banged up. It looks like it's got all kinds of stones on the front of it. And it doesn't make any sense to me because when you're racing up Pikes Peak, you're not behind anybody. And he said, oh, well, that's another great story. Uh, he said, you know, where that came from was one year uh, in practice. Um, you know, the drivers all go up a third of the way up the mountain in practice, get up the top. And, and he decided... Uh, with a couple of the unsers that they would race down wheel to wheel and pass each other and just have a great time coming down. And so they did that. And that's where all these stone chips came from was when the unsers got in front of them and, and sprayed all the stone and dirt uh, debris on the front of his car, it, it dinged up the front of his car. 
of course, they then got down to the uh, to the start line, and uh, unfortunately, the officials along the way had called that down and reported them. And he said, "This is yet another time he got read the riot act by the officials. They threatened to kick all three of them out. They said you're endangering yourselves and others. We can't have this. This is completely unbecoming of uh, hill climb competitors." Um, but again, uh, as, as Bruce tends to do, he got out of it. But he says in this case, the only reason he uh, he got out of it and was able to actually race that year was because the names of the other two people who were involved in this were Unser and the hill climb was not gonna kick them out so they couldn't really kick him out. So again, just a, a, a great story here. Um, one of the other uh, great legends on Pikes Peak, Ari Vatanen, uh, world rally champion. So again, in the days when uh, the uh, the race was all on dirt. Uh, the uh, the rally guys were uh, were great. They brought a lot of their world rally cars out uh, that had massive horsepower and were meant to go on dirt and were incredibly fast. Um, and one of the the great videos, if you've got time to check this out, it would uh, you'd have some fun with it. If you go on YouTube and look up Climb Dance, uh, like it is on the screen here, um, you can watch him in uh, an edited video of several of his, of his practice runs going up Pikes Peak. People think it's during the race, it's actually uh, some practice runs. Um, and it's just wild to see this, uh, uh, see this you know, legendary driver go up in a, a legendary car uh, that he drove for Peugeot. And I think it was 85, something like 84, 85, something in the, in the kind of mid 80, 80s period. Um, what people love about this video, other than the, the great driving and all that and the sliding around on the dirt is that um, at, at one point he comes around a corner and keep in mind, I mentioned that we start practicing every morning at sunrise. He comes around the corner and there's the sun right in front of him beaming into his face and he can't see anything. And, you know, you probably know how, you know, if you've seen rally drivers drive before, they're always like this with the steering wheel. Well, he just keeps going like this, but he takes one hand off and shields his eyes and he's still driving like this around a corner at ridiculous speeds. And he does it a couple of times. Um, and uh, he says to this day, so it's, this has been 30 plus years um, since that all that happened. He said, people come up to him all the time and say, you know, can, he, can you pose for a picture with me and go like this, like you're shielding the sun. Uh, and he said, he, you know, he's happy to do that, uh, you know, to this day. But his great quote was, you can raise your hand, but never lift your foot. Again, a reason why this is a, he's, he's been such a successful uh, driver over the years. What, uh, you know, so you think you think this would strike fear into a lot of the the drivers who do Pikes Peak, um, and you know it was interesting. That was a common question that I asked all the drivers I spoke to. Is I said, so you know, what's your biggest fear? And what really surprised me is there was a common thread amongst almost all of the uh, the drivers. Um, and you'd be surprised what the answer is. The most common fear among hill climb, hill climb drivers that I have found has been heights, which is shocking to me that you're, you're choosing to race up Pikes Peak. Nobody's forcing you to, choosing to race up Pikes Peak even though you're afraid of heights. Uh, but uh, it's absolutely what I found in talking to people that a lot of these drivers are terribly afraid of heights, uh, including one of the most uh, famous ones, Bobby Unser, terrified of heights. Um, so, um, just to kind of wrap this, uh, wrap this up, my, my personal experience on Pikes Peak. Um, as you see, I'm in the shop with, uh, with the race car that I've raced up Pikes Peak every time I've done it. Um, the, the first six times I raced up there, it was in, in, a, um, uh, in this car with a traditional Porsche powertrain. So uh, it had an internal combustion engine, which over the years grew from a three liter motor to a, um, 3.6 liter motor to a 3.8 liter motor. We kept improving it every year. Um, but then uh, for the 2019 race, we made a dramatic change to the car and converted it to full electric, which was uh, again, uh, just a, a massive undertaking uh, and um, very, very impressive. I was lucky enough uh, to get uh, contacted uh, by somebody who's become a good friend since then uh, who had a crazy idea of transplanting the internal combustion engine in here uh, with a, uh, an electric powertrain, which he had already done in a car 
um, in a in a streetcar that he had taken on track and um, thought it was a, a you know a potential good conversion of a of, of a hill climb car and what better way to prove the superiority of uh, electric over internal combustion than uh, to take it up on Pikes Peak with a car that's already won up there and hopefully go even quicker. So we did that um, and uh, it, uh, it performed very nicely in 2019 and we're actually working on it right now in preparation for 2022. And people might say, well, you're working on it for 2022. Why aren't you working on it for the race in two weeks from now? Um, what we've learned over the years is preparation for Pikes Peak takes many, many months. Uh, and trying to throw something together at the last minute is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so we like to say, so even though we're 54 weeks out right now from the 2022 race, we already feel like we're behind schedule. Uh, we know how much work there is to do on the car to uh, make it into a truly competitive uh, car, but um, we're very optimistic about uh, what that's going to do. But electric on Pikes Peak is a great combination. Um, as uh, if, if any of you have driven a, an EV on the street, you know the torque is very impressive. It doesn't have to spool up in the same way that uh, internal combustion uh, motors do. Um, it's not reliant on oxygen. Uh, it doesn't breathe oxygen like we human beings do or like an internal combustion engine does. So it's not subject to gasping when it gets up at, uh, at high altitude. It doesn't care. It's not even aware of what uh, altitude it's at. So you don't have a loss of power going up there. Again, if we go back to the, the track map, remember the highest speed portion of uh, Pikes Peak is at the very top when oxygen is, uh, is at a premium. So, um, you know, really, really impressive uh, and, and really well suited to it. Um, people have actually been running electric vehicles up Pikes Peak for about 30, 35 years now, believe it or not. Um, but just recently, as EV technology, battery technology has advanced, um, they've become fairly dominant on Pikes Peak. There have been uh, you know, several very impressive runs, including uh, overall wins by electric vehicles on Pikes Peak over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, the internal combustion guys are still trying to give us a, a run for our money, but um, most people acknowledge that the, the future for Pikes Peak, um, like it or not, is probably electric. Uh, again, there are just so many built-in advantages um, that makes uh, an electric powertrain well suited to uh, uh, to Pikes Peak. So um, there's just a few pictures of uh, the car as it exists now, as you can see it behind me here, um, in EV form. So it kind of looks the same from the outside. It kind of still looks like a, a very retro racing Porsche, but under the skin, uh, virtually everything underneath it is uh, is very, very new technology and has been replaced. When we converted this car to electric, it wasn't just a change of the powertrain. We had to change practically everything about the car from the brakes to the wheels, to the tires, to uh, well, the pedal cluster, even the steering wheel changed, the seat changed, everything inside the car, the roll cage, everything changed about this car. Um, to make it uh, safe and quick uh, with, an, with an EV powertrain. Um, and you can see when we run up there, it's very challenging conditions. This is not unusual that you have snow that is, I don't know, what is that, 10, 15 feet deep um, on the side of the road. That is very common. And I imagine it's that way right now up there. I haven't been up in a little bit, uh, but uh, I imagine it's, it's just like this. It's always like that when we're racing up there. Um, now, fortunately, the snow isn't on the road, but the challenge you get is because it's the end of June, the snow is melting, right? And so as it melts, it, it, it melts across the road. And so as we're racing up on the, uh, on the asphalt going up Pikes Peak, we often have to go across little sections of wet uh, pavement, which in your street car at 10 or 20 miles an hour, not a problem. In a race car going as fast as it possibly can around these corners, on slick tires, it's a problem. Uh, slick tires and uh, standing water, it's like driving on ice, if you can picture what that's like. So um, again, just more of the charm of, uh, of the race. Um, and uh, yeah, here's a, a little picture of um, version one of the electric powertrain. Uh, and what you'll see there in version one of the electric powertrain, we had six electric motors in the back there. 
Each one of those motors is out of a zero motorcycle. So it's like having six electric motorcycles in the back of the car. Um, it's now upgraded to eight. And so, uh, it's, it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really cool setup that we've got. And you'll see um, to drive all that, we've got four batteries, um, two in the passenger compartment and two in the, uh, the front trunk or the frunk as people like to say. Um, and uh, yeah, it, there's, it's, a, it's an unbelievable system. And so that's just a few little quick pictures of, of what that looks like. So with that, um, I'm just to kind of wrap it up and um, happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Um, if you want to reach me after this, you're more than welcome to. If you go to peakofracing.com, there's a, a contact us thing there. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you've got, even if it's unrelated to the book or anything that we've done. If you want advice on how to watch the race or that sort of thing, happy to help with any of that. But um, with that, uh, thank you to uh, the Manitou Springs Heritage Center for inviting me to do this. And uh, hopefully we can do this in person next time. Oh, let's hope so, Chris. Thank you so much for your great presentation this morning. It's always entertaining. But you know, I do have one question. You know, we got a race coming up on the 27th. And uh, what do you do to prepare for this race, both mentally and physically? That is an awesome question. Um, and it is, it's a, uh, uh, you know, is there's a ton of obviously car preparation. And like I said, 54 weeks out from next year's race, we feel like we're already behind with the car. But in terms of the driver, um, I've been really fortunate to get connected up um, with a, a legendary uh, racing coach um, who kind of took me under his wing 10 years ago or so, um, who uh, gets me very well prepared physically and mentally for this race specifically, but for racing in general. And um, to, to kind of boil it down, the state that he tries to get me into, and the mental part is actually um, pr probably more important than the physical part. He tries to get me into a mental state where he said, I want you to get to the summit on race day and not really know how you got there. Because I want a whole drive, and you know how you know we've all experienced that, right? Where you you drive to the grocery store or to the gas station, you don't remember the drive there at all, right? And you know you just do it subconsciously. We drive every day, you know we're used to it. We're in a, a familiar environment, and we just do it, um, and we do it safely, and we do it well. And so his whole thing is, you know, you want to get uh, the the operation of your brain on a subconscious level because things happen so quickly in a race car. Uh, and going up Pikes Peak where you're turning all the time, you don't have time. If you're doing it consciously and thinking about, oh, I need to break here and here's the speed I need to have in this corner. And then I need to get on the accelerator at this point. You're, you're just going to be analyzing everything in real time. And as we all know, our real time brains operate pretty slowly, but the subconscious brain operates really quickly. So it's all around getting the, the subconscious brain um, to control everything and just make it all happen automatically. Um, on, a, on a physical side of things, one of the things I, I finally gave into that I fought for, for several years um, was to have oxygen. Um, and, uh, and that's been, uh, I think, very helpful. Um, for years, I said, I don't need oxygen up there. You know, I, I live at 7,400 feet already, right? You know, I can understand the people who live at sea level maybe needing oxygen, but, you know, I don't need that. Uh, but, you know, I got talked into it by my uh, crew chief a few years ago, and I think it's been a, a very positive thing. Again, uh, not, not so much maybe, you know, it, it's a physical thing, yes, but it, again, helps your brain to operate better. Your brain needs, needs oxygen too, right? So, right. Um, yeah, that's a, that, I could go on for hours, Michael, but that's the, that's the quick answer. So do racers actually experience um, uh, altitude sickness as they run this race? Not yet. Probably, I haven't heard so many cases of altitude sickness, but bad decision making, yes, due to due to lack of oxygen, yeah. Some of the some of the big crashes that have uh, occurred up there in the race and in practice have later been attributed to just lack of oxygen, lack of clear thinking. Where where drivers who know the whole course get disoriented and don't know what turn they're at and go you know too fast into a corner, um, you know that's happened multiple times, and so. Um, you know, I think the, the oxygen just helps to make better decisions quicker uh, and, and just eliminate that chance for, you know, again, 
in a lot of cases here, you know, your first mistake might be your last. So you, you, you really don't want to make big mistakes on, on Pikes Peak. All right. Your other mistake would be lifting your foot, right? <laughs> That's almost as big a sin in the world of, of race car driving, right? Is going too slow through a corner. Um, you know, you want to be right on the very edge of crashing on every corner. That's, um, and, and I do a lot of coaching of people on, not on Pikes Peak, but on, on road courses. And I always say, you know, it, if you get to the point where you're actually a little bit afraid on every corner and you think you're going to crash, that's where you want to be. That's, that's right on the edge. And that's really where you need to be, particularly on Pikes Peak, where it's so competitive and you've got people who are, you know, you've got these professional drivers in factory cars who are well-funded and they do this, you know, 365 days a year, practically. Um, and, you know, those amateurs of us, you know, we really need to be able to maximize our performance because, you know, those guys are going to be maximizing their performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here with Chris Lennon this morning, racer Chris Lennon, who will be participating in this year's Pikes Peak International Hill Climb. Uh, thank you, Chris, again, for your presentation of the book, again, is The Art, The Peak of Racing. I, <laughs> sorry about it. The Peak of Racing, which is available at the Manitou Springs Heritage Center bookstore, which can be found at manitousprintsheritagecenter.org. Chris will be out here on the sidelines cheering you on this, this year, and good luck at the race. Uh, this year's race at the International Hill Climb. It's a very exciting race. If you haven't seen one before, now is your chance to see. You can still get tickets online at www.ppihc.org. And uh, again, thank you so much, Chris, this morning. If there aren't any other questions, uh, that will conclude this morning's presentation. Thank you again, everybody. And thank you, Chris. Always a pleasure, Michael. All right. We'll see ya.